Unit 73, Riding the Desert Camel. Mention camel, and we quickly think of the desert, usually the Sahara Desert of North Africa. But did you know that the camel was native first to North America? This was 40 million years ago. The camel probably got to Africa by migrating to South America. This was a large land mass that broke in two. The eastern part we now call Africa. The journey took millions of years. Camels stand six to seven feet tall and weigh up to one thousand and six hundred pounds. They have long, strong legs and powerful muscles. A camel can carry as much as a thousand pounds for a short distance. But for long distances, its typical load is about four hundred pounds. When a camel walks or runs, both legs on one side of its body move forward at the same time. Then the legs on the other side swing forward. This leg action makes for a swaying, rocking motion. Some riders get seasick. This may be part of the reason that camels are sometimes called sheep of the desert. A camel's back is broad. It is too broad to let both of the rider's feet hang down. There's no use for stirrups. Well, then, how do you ride a camel? Camel drivers teach you to wrap one leg around the tall saddle horn, then tuck the foot beneath the other leg. Let this leg just dangle, or you can wrap both legs around the horn and sit cross-legged. As for your hands, you can hold the reins gently, but if the going gets rough, you can clutch the saddle horn in desperation. Once you get used to the camel's constant rocking gait, though, you can almost be lulled to sleep. Unit seventy four: A line on kites. Kites are sources of childhood fun. But did you know that not all kites were used as toys? In seventeen fifty two, Ben Franklin used the kite to prove that lightning and electricity are the same. He made a flat kite. Then he tied a piece of iron wire to it. This he knew would attract. The lightning. Next, he used a ball of hemp string. At the end of the string, he tied a long silk ribbon. The ribbon would serve as a protective insulator. Between the string and the ribbon, he attached a brass key. The kite rose into a dark cloud. Soon, the rain-wet string began to stiffen. It bristled as if it were alive. Franklin knew electricity was coursing down the string. He put his finger near the key. A series of sparks jumped from key to finger. He felt the sharp tingle of the sparks. These were really electrical shocks. Franklin's experiment was dangerous. It took great courage. Others experimented with kites too. In 1749, two Scotsmen tied a thermometer to a kite. They recorded the temperature of the clouds. Then, in 1883, two Englishmen tied a wind meter to a kite. The speed of the wind was measured at 1,200 feet. The suspension bridge at Niagara Falls was begun by a kite. The kite carried a light line over the gorge. Then the light line drew a heavier one across. Finally, a steel cable was pulled over. This next event made world history. In 1901, Guglielmo Marconi wanted to prove that the radio signal could be sent across the Atlantic. But first, he had to overcome the curve of the Earth. He had a brilliant idea. In Newfoundland, he had the receiving antenna raised high in the air on the tail of a kite. 
the signal came over the Atlantic loud and clear. Unit 75. The Flying Penguin Penguins are great swimmers. They are better than many other totally aquatic creatures. Penguins are really birds, but they cannot fly. They lost that ability millions of years ago. Their wings developed into flippers. Now, the flippers serve as paddles in the water. Penguins once also had regular bird feet, but over millions of years, the feet became webbed. The flippers and the webbed feet make penguins swift swimmers and deep divers. Why the change from a flying to a swimming bird? Scientists only guess. It may have been a need for food. There was nothing else available, so penguins constantly dove into schools of fish. Then another great change took place. Nature equipped the penguin's body with built-in shock absorbers. These are feathers that grow straight out from the body and then toward their ends take a right-angled turn. Why does the penguin need these? After dining in the water, the bird has a problem. It needs to get back on top of an ice floe. The flows are some five or six feet above the water. Here is what the penguin does. It swims in close. It measures the height of the flow with a watery eye. It turns and heads out some thirty feet. Then it turns toward the flow and races at top speed underwater. Scientists have clocked its speed to about sixty miles per hour. Now, here's the tricky part. Just short of the ice flow, the penguin plans upwards and becomes a hurtling area torpedo. Most of the time, a penguin will make it to the top of the ice flow, but on occasion, it smacks hard into the icy side of the flow. The impact will be hard enough to cripple the penguin or even kill it. But the ingenious feather shock absorbers save it. Unit 76 Courage and Nobility It was September of 1862. General Robert E. Lee marched into Maryland. He led 50,000 troops. Lee's best officer, Stonewall Jackson, was there too. He rode at the head of his troops into the town of Frederick. In the morning, 40 Union flags graced the town. Each owner quickly hauled his town. They heard the tramping of feet and the striking of hooves. The streets were empty now. Everyone was hiding behind shuttered windows. But one old woman did not hide. Barbara Fritchie took out her flag and hung it from her attic window. Stonewall Jackson, riding ahead, spied the flag. The order of fire brought a shattering of glass and splintering of wood. As the broken staff was cracking and falling, a wrinkled old hand reached out. Barbara Fretchy caught the flag, now tattered and filled with holes. According to legend, this is what she said. Shoot, if you must, this old gray head. But spare your country's flag. Writing below, Jackson heard her words. He was a brave and noble man. He must also have been impressed with the old woman's bravery and nobility. He turned to his troops. He ordered them to stop shooting. Barbara Fragi was unharmed. Fragi's house still stands. The one-and-a-half-story brick building is in Frederick. Her clothing, her spinning wheel, her Bible are still waiting, and the flag hangs over her house. Unit 77, The Faithful Dog Which animal is man's best friend? We all know it's the dog. Dogs 
have earned the love and respect of humans. Many have given their own lives to save people. Dogs are faithful and devoted. For example, Bobby, a Sky Terrier, went to market with his Scottish master every day. After the man died, Bobby would not move from his grave. He stayed there for about ten years. He stayed until he died. Dogs serve many useful functions. They are good at watching and herding sheep. Wherever sheep are raised, a sheep herding dog is developed. For instance, there is the German Shepherd dog. In Scotland, there is the Shetland sheep dog. Both are recognized breeds. Specially trained dogs lead the blind. Such dogs are carefully selected. It takes about three to five months to train them. Guide dogs will refuse to cross a busy street unless the traffic has stopped. One interesting dog is the Saint Bernard. How did it get its name? It was developed by the monks of the Saint Bernard Monastery. This is located in the Alps of Switzerland. The dog weighs from 140 to 220 pounds. It's one of the heaviest of all dogs. Saint Bernards are famous for rescuing travelers lost in the snow. They have a wonderful sense of smell. They find people buried under several feet of snow. A Saint Bernard named Barry rescued 40 persons. This was over a period of years. There is a popular misconception about these dogs. They do not carry flasks around their necks. Sir Edwin Landseer misrepresented them this way in a painting.